Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40K's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar. And I'm Yuxin. And we are the chroniclers of all that was, and all that will be in the 41st millennium. We've seen the rise and fall of many empires, and this month, we'll be discussing the nuns with guns, the Adeptus Sororitas. Indeed, this month we will chronicle how they came to be, what role they play in the Imperium of Man, with some noble characters along the way. Well, Zekdar, what are we going to be talking about this week? <clears throat> well, this week, I figured we have to start with the beginning, the origins of the Sisters of Battle. But Zekdar, didn't you already cover that in your box, the Age of Apostasy? I did! And for those of you who didn't watch that Vox, please feel free to do so. It's an interesting part of the Imperium's history. But we should discuss the Sisters of Battle in this era, because this is where their story begins. Now, by this point in history, Gauge Van Dier had complete control of the Imperium of Man when he heard of a strange Imperial cult on the planet of San Leo, consisting only of warrior women known as the Daughters of the Emperor. Intrigued by this interesting cult, Van Dier realized they would prove to be a potent addition to his personal forces. As such, he arranged for San Leo to receive a rare ecclesiarchal visit. But after the large ecclesiarchal retinue arrived on San Lior and made its way to the Daughters of the Emperor's Covenant, the sisters barred the ecclesiarch from entering, claiming that they did not believe that he truly served the will of the Emperor. Now, having expected such an insolent response from such a pious group of women in light of his reputation as a tyrant, Van Deer knew exactly what to do to get them on his side. Van Deer convinced the daughters that he was personally blessed by the emperor when he told Dominica to fire a weapon at him. The shot bounced off the high lord, who was secretly wearing a conversion field generator, though he pretended that it was the emperor himself who would not allow him to be harmed, earning the daughters absolute but naive loyalty as they had never seen such advanced technology before. He then took the daughters as his new ecclesiarchal bodyguard and brought them back with him to Terra. From then on, the warrior women became his personal retinue of soldiers and companions, and Van Deer renamed them the Brides of the Emperor. They were trained by the best mentors in the Austro Militarum to combine their own skills with the modern weapons of war. Word of their dedication to the protection of Van Deer spread throughout the Imperium. They were his constant guardians and his silent executioners, who would kill with a word from the Lord. Now, the brides not only served as Van Deer's bodyguard, but also as his servants and, um, companions. They tasted the High Lord's food, fed him when he fell weak with illness, nursed his frail body back to health, and entertained him with singing, dancing, and, um, uh, more exotic skills. Yet, for all their gaiety on occasion, the brides of the Emperor were still hardened fighters. And when the Holy Synoid, of the Ecclesiarchy tried to have Van Deer assassinated a few years later to rid themselves of the tyrant. The brides went into the Sinoid's meeting chamber, locked the doors, and emerged a solar hour later carrying the severed heads of every cardinal present. Opposition to Van Deer within the Ecclesiarchy collapsed swiftly soon after. Now, I'm going to skip a bit further ahead to the end of the Reign of Blood, to the Terran War. Now, needless to say, the Imperium was pretty fed up with the tyrannical rule of Gauge Van Deer. So much so that the Adeptus Astartes and the Mechanicus actually banded together to lay siege to Terra to remove him from office permanently. Now, you must understand, throughout the Reign of Blood, one faction had remained apart from the bloodshed and devastation of the era. Within the secure walls of the Imperial Palace, the Adeptus Custodes, the guardians of the Emperor himself, had continued their eternal vigil over the Golden Throne. To escape the anarchy that prevailed in the wider Imperium, and to ensure the protection of the Emperor, the custodians had cut themselves off from the outside completely. Only scraps of information passed through the sealed walls, and that most sacred of places in the galaxy. And it was only when the Space Marines and the Adeptus Mechanicus moved against Van Deer that the full extent of the treachery perpetrated by the renegade High Lord became known to them. In secret meetings with the commanders of the Space Marines, the Adeptus Custodes learned of the Reign of Blood and how the Brides of the Emperor defended the traitorous High Lord. The mysterious order advised the Space Marines continue their attack while they would do what they could. A small contingent of Custodians 
led by a centurion of the Companions, made its way into the very heart of Van Deer's domain, surfacing within the Ecclesiarchal Palace, not far from Van Deer's audience chambers. They were confronted by the Brides of the Emperor. Calling for a truce and a parley, the centurion laid down his weapons and walked unarmed to meet the guardians of Van Deer. For a solar hour, he made an impassioned plea for the brides to revoke their oaths, striving to convince them that they were fighting for evil, not the emperor. However, they were not to be swayed by his arguments, and the nameless centurion had only one option left, leaving his warriors as hostages. The centurion guided their leader, Alicia Dominica, and her personal bodyguard of five female warriors, known as Arabella, Catherine, Lucia, Mina, and Sylvana into the center of the imperial palace itself, the Sanctum Imperialis, to stand before the god emperor upon his golden throne. What occurred in this sacred chamber is not recorded. But when the brides of the emperor stepped through the ultimate gate, once more into the outer palace, their eyes burned with unparalleled anger and hatred. Without a word, the centurion led them back through the dark places of the earth, this time leading them directly back to Van Deer's audience chamber in the Ecclesiarchal Palace. Alicia Dominica spoke of the treachery of Van Deer and his depraved corruption of the Ecclesiarchy. But most of all, she spoke of his twisted perversion of their own order. Burning with shame and anger, they renounced the name of the brides of the emperor and once again became the daughters of the emperor. Alicia Dominica and her vengeful sisters confronted the corrupt Van Deer within his own chambers. The words that she spoke during this confrontation are engraved upon the black marble of her sarcophagus. You have committed the ultimate heresy. Not only have you turned your back on the emperor and stepped from his light, you have profaned his name and almost destroyed everything he has strived to build. You have perverted and twisted the path he has laid for mankind to tread. As your own decrees have stated... There can be no mercy for such a crime, no pity for such a criminal. I renounce your lordship. You walk in the darkness and cannot be allowed to live. Your sentence has been long overdue, and now it is time for you to die. With this proclamation, Dominica drew her power sword and held it aloft for all to see. Van Deer glanced around the assembled warriors, his brow knitted in confusion. Even at the end, the insane High Lord appeared so divorced from reality that he could scarce comprehend Alicia's words. Shaking his head slightly, the High Lord whispered his last words. I, I don't have time to die. I'm too busy. The power sword slashed down, beheading the traitorous High Lord in one stroke. It is said that Van Deer's Rosarus, which had protected him upon San Lior, now failed him, its gleaming form cleaved in two by Alicia's blow. The reign of blood had ended with a blade wielded, by the hand of true faith. After the coup was finished, Sebastian Thor became the new ecclesiarch and disbanded the ecclesiarchy's armies of fanatical fraternist Templars. But he realized the church still needed soldiers to protect it. Thus, the daughters of the emperor became the Adepta Sororitas Orders Militant, who became better known in the imperial imagination as the Sisters of Battle. Well, brother, what do you think of the origins of this sect of warrior women? Well... Truth be told, it's interesting how supposedly they, this is a side note, but the Sisters of Battle aren't the only force for the Ecclesiarchy, though, are they? At this point in history, they actually were, at the end of okay. the Age of Apostasy. Now, because before that, anyways, the Ecclesiarchy had the Fraternist Templars, and they could, and, well, okay, Actually, during the Reign of Blood, Goge Van Deer literally ran everything. So <laughs> he not only had the Fraternus Templars, he also had the Austria Militarum. And uh, the only ones he really didn't control all that much was the Mechanicus, which has always been kind of, you know, as you know, Euxen, kind of a... They're their own state. Yeah, yeah. And then the other one was actually the Astartes. The Astartes kind of looked at this, this whole reign of blood and the age of apostasy, and they were just kind of like, you know what? This is a human affair. We're going to go ahead and keep defending the borders. I'm sure you guys will figure it out. And then when there were the salamanders who were attacked and yeah, no, 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 
No, all of them, pretty much. The salamander is the one that you, yeah. you the, the thing that you're thinking of, anyways. Actually, took place at the end of the reign of blood. Right. So by the yeah, end of the reign I, of blood, what ended up happening was is that the uh, star days they kind of looked at this and they went, "This is Bolsheviks. We need we need to do something about this <laughs> because if we don't, right. while we are protecting the borders and you know like Xenos aren't really getting in and demons really aren't getting in, there's going to be nothing left to protect." If we don't do something about this. Yeah, and they're starting to now attack us when we're trying to protect them. <laughs> Pretty much. So it's kind like, of like, you know, the salamanders. Uh, it's kind of like, I don't know if you ever saw this, Yuxin, but there's, there was this video that popped up a few years ago on YouTube. And it was this really annoying short guy at a donut store. He's just called the Donut Man, I think. And he's just like screaming and yelling he's like the perfect karen and all of a sudden you just hear this guy in the back of the line just go okay that's it <laughs> this guy gets one second to turn around and just boom he's decked and everybody applauded that's kind of what happened with the adeptus astartes here they just finally went okay no enough <laughs> they kind of marched in and, and took care of business but they did have a lot of help anyways with the as i mentioned anyways the custodes and the sisters of battle or at the time, anyways, the wives of the, the emperor. I guess that brings another thought to mind, but anyway. what, 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 what? It's like, why weren't the custodes doing anything? Well, that isn't their purview, right? Their purview is right blood over the golden throne. It's like, oh, you, you've you absolutely got it, man. But he's like, literally less than a mile away. Does it matter? As far as I've read, now mind you, anyways, my 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 understanding of the lore of the custodies is 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 very thin. Yeah. But mainly on how they're made and Constantine Valdor. But <laughs> from my understanding is, is that their sole purpose is literally to defend the golden throne. They really don't do anything else. Now, actually, now that I say that, I think now that Rabute Gilliman is back around anyways, I think he travels with a bunch of custodes. But at this point, that's all they were doing. We guard the gar Golden Throne, and eventually they get word of all this stuff, and they do actually take action. So they're just like, okay, we, we got to do After something. After everything's pretty much been done. <laughs> right. As you know, they were probably just sitting there playing cards. And <laughs> so Gilliman is like, aren't you going to do anything about this? Not her but job. I'm up 500 denarii or whatever they use. I'm up 500 credits. You have to do something. Okay, fine. <laughs> or thrones, I think is what they or call thrones. them on Terra. Yeah. Thrones. Uh, but but what do you think, anyways, of, of, of their origins? They do have kind of an interesting, well, first off, the fact that they were befuddled into this whole mess, I find kind of interesting. Well, to be fair, a lot of where they get their people from were befuddled into it. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Well, a lot of them is just like, for example, how did they, they get the mechanicus, the majority of the mechanicus to join? Well, he is the <laughs> Omnissiah. <laughs> really? Yes. Okay, we'll follow him. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I, I just think... If you shoot me and I live... I am under the authority of the Emperor. I'm wearing protective gear that nothing can penetrate. Okay, well, okay. Well, hang on half a second, Yuxin. <laughs> if you were there and you didn't know what a generator field was, and <laughs> your leader took a gun and pointed it at the guy's head and hit the trigger, and he just seemed completely fine, not only that, but the way that these fields work is that it kind of flashes for a bit. And then he just says, I am protected by the emperor. I mean, would you th really honestly think foul play there? I don't think I would. I mean, I'd be like, wow, <laughs> that's kind of impressive. And I'd probably still be a bit skeptical, but that's because I'd also be writing on a different standpoint of like, is this witchcraft? Well, you're also a stick in the mud, Yuxin. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> it does kind of... Uh, I, I do actually have a question for you. Uh, how, at this point anyways, how is the Adeptus Sororitas run, Yuxin? I mean, how does such a large organization work? Well, in the 41st millennium, the Adeptus Sororitas is still part of the Ecclesiarchy, 
Well, it has been divided into two convents. The convent Prioris is located on Terra, and the convent Sanctorum is based on the shrine world of Ophelia Seven. The convents of the Sisterhood are organized into several smaller subchapters known as orders. Now, each order follows the basic hierarchical structures. An order is led by the most senior canonist, called the Canonist Superior, who commands and administrates the entire order. Each canonist superior is subservient only to the will of the abbess sanctorum. The order is divided into preceptories. The preceptory contains a single convent with up to 1,000 sisters. It is led by a sister with the rank of canonist preceptor or prioress. Oh, so kind of like the uh, Stardis chapter where there are only like a 1,000 of them? Correct. Who said the empire can't be symmetrical? <laughs> Fair enough. Preceptories are split into the commanderies. A commandery normally comprises of several smaller convents or detachments of the Order of Militant Sisters from a single convent with up to 200 Sisters of Battle, commanded by a canonist commander. A commandery is more or less equal in size to a Space Marines company. Finally, the smallest unit in the order is a mission, which is pretty much another name for a squad. Now, you may be wondering where all these women come from, how the Adeptus fills the ranks. Um, let me guess. They're all orphans. Actually, yes. How did you know? Uh, lucky guess. Sorry. Yes. Carry on. Well, while most are orphans, a few are transferred from outside organizations. In particular, the ranks of the servants of the Inquisition, although this is relatively unusual and only undertaken following lengthy consideration. Have you been identified as a candidate for membership? The individuals are shipped to one of the two primary convents on Terra or Ophelia 7, where she will be subjected to a lengthy and arduous regimen of testing as a novice intended to gauge her suitability to join the sisterhood and to identify which of the orders she would be most suited to, regardless of which order she will eventually join, all novices undergo extensive instruction in traditions of the Adeptus Sororitas, and most receive at least a modicum of military instruction. Once a novice is judged worthy to join the sisterhood, swear her vows to the emperor, and has completed her basic training, the candidates are gathered in the Great Hall of the Convent before the candidates and palatines of the orders to which they will be assigned. One by one, the name of each candidate and the order she will join is announced in... Wait, what's that music? Oh, sorry, I figured I could add some graduation music here, some pomp and circumstance. Uh, carry on. You're oh, doing great. Okay. And the newly elevated sister will be led off to begin her vocation. Once she is assigned to her order, the sister will begin a period of even more rigorous training and indoctrination, which, it is said, will never end till she sits in death at the right hand of the emperor. Now, unlike the depth of stars, the sisterhood is united into a single organization with a centralized ruling body. The overall head of the Adeptus Sororitas holds the rank of Abbas Sanctorum, as elected from and by the leaders of all the orders. Beneath the Abbas Sanctorum are two priorities, one leading each convent, and below these, the canonesses superior of each individual order. There exists a hierarchy of sorts amongst these leaders, though to outsiders it is highly arcane and ritualistic and based on a system of precedence. Orders that were established by the Ecclesiarchal Writ are ranked higher in order of precedence than those that were formed by a group playing off from a pre-existent order. This is especially visible in the six orders militant majoris, each of which has spawned dozens of smaller, lesser orders militants the Kansas's superior of which rank lower in the order of precedence than those of their parent organization. 
The Cats' superior are aided in their duties by their order's palantine. These are highly experienced and capable officers, from whose ranks the next Cats' superior will be drawn. It is the palantines that often lead missions in the field. Whether the order is an order militant fighting the enemies of mankind or an order hospitaller establishing a hospital at the front lines. Below the Palantines are essentially the non-commissioned officers known as the Sisters Superior, who lead or supervise groups of their sisters in whatever tasks the order in question is focused upon. Members of the Deptus Sororitis can and do transfer from one order to another, depending on their own unique skills and experience. In particular, a sister of an order militant may eventually transfer to a non-militant order to carry on the emperor's work should age or injury render her less effective a warrior. Furthermore, it is not unheard of for a senior member of the sisterhood to transfer to another organization entirely. Really? Strangely, yes. Huh. It has been recorded that several canonesses have been known to have become inquisitors, one a cardinal palatine and one even a rogue trader. Wow, really? A rogue trader? Okay, S seriously, a rogue trader? Well, the person obviously went went off the deep end. <laughs> well, I would have said well, the found same out, thing. The found out, no, no, more likely they found out they were like a lost, long relative heir. To rogue trader and so they're just like okay so you know <laughs> we have this letter of mark oh, hang on you're hang the on, only you're person saying. left do you want it or not it's like you said she's she's been fighting in all these wars and all of a sudden the information comes to her and she's like really i'm not an orphan <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like well in fact yes technically you are now <laughs> but Okay, so to me, anyways, I, I I gotta say, to me, this this organization does there there are a bunch, anyways, that really aren't part of the chapter that are non militant. It seems like the structure itself is very military. Yeah, even though they're using a lot of church names, so to speak, it's really. I mean, you could replace canonists for major, or well, probably canonists. You probably replace that with probably what general. I, I don't know. And the sister superior is definitely a sergeant, though, right? Right. So it, it seems it's Every like very time that I mentioned Palatines, I I do think, wow, they have so many emperors. <laughs> but you know, Karen uh, Forty Two Star Wars reference. Oh, Yuxin. Yes, we're not talking about Star Wars. <laughs> Only one. Man, man. there's Only thousands one. of emperors out there. Join me, join the dark side. <laughs> you're you're the attentive sororitist. Yes. Good, good. Something, something dark side. <laughs> Anyways, I, I just I, I just find that actually fairly interesting. Well, especially because I mean they have a bunch of like really non-militant groups that to me, anyways, after a lot of reading about them, I think are actually a little bit more important. To, to be yeah, honest, but, though, they did start off from... Daughters of the Emperor. Yeah, the Daughters of the Emperor, which were a militant group. Right, right. So, And and after that, anyways, when they became, you know, the wives of the... or the Emperor's bride, brides, they, they still held a very, like, bodyguard warrior very aspect. Militant. Right. Although, and like everything else in the Imperium, they went, eh, why should we change? <laughs> well, no, I mean, okay. So real quick here, anyways, I've got a question for you before, before we carry on. What to you, anyways, is a difference between a soldier and a warrior? Because this, this will kind of tie in, anyways, to how I think, anyways, they have drastically changed from when they first started. But, but go ahead. What do you think, anyways, is the difference between a warrior and a soldier? Or is there a difference? Generally, a warrior is put into one particular type of role, whereas a soldier may be put into multiple different positions. Like, for example, a medic could be considered a soldier, but you would not really refer to a medic as a warrior. 
Right. In a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah, in a lot of cases. I would, I would, I, I kind of disagree with you a little bit on this. It, you, it's almost like you almost got there, <laughs> but not quite. To me, anyways, the difference is, is that a warrior is somebody that is is skilled and very well orchestrated in the concept of war. They're great fighters, but they're singular. A soldier, on the other hand, anyways, is somebody that has been disciplined into working with a unit in the concepts of war. You, you understand the difference there, what I'm saying? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but... Okay, why not? Because there are many cases where uh, a group of people would be referred to as warriors of this nation or warriors of that nation. Right. Yet they, they are raised to fight together. No, okay. So, okay. So, I'm not saying that you can't have a warrior that is a soldier as well. So, a warrior could be a soldier as well because they have the education, they've been educated and they can fight in a unit. But normally, when you think of warrior, you think singular. Does that make a little bit more sense? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, and, and a lot of times, anyways, when you think of, like, for instance, Terran 42, when you think of, like, the warrior barbarians of the north with the Romans. You Normally, anyways, when they talk about that, it is like a bunch of warriors trying to fight a group of soldiers. And normally it doesn't end well for the warriors. The warriors normally tend to do fairly well at the beginning, but eventually, anyways, it's that age-old concept of well, especially in Terran 42 with Romans anyways, it was just kind of like, well, we're shorter, <laughs> we're smaller than you guys from the north, but it's the question of can you beat you as a warrior, can you beat me and the guy to my left, the guy to the my right, and the three guys behind me? It's a constant more of numbers. us plus. What's that? There's more of us. <laughs> well, it's plus not just more of us. We are better equipped. Well, it's not just more of us. It's the concept in any ways of fighting as a cohesive unit as opposed to singularly, which is normally when you, what you think of like a warrior. I mean, we have all sorts of instances, though, like, for instance, Conan the Barbarian. Did he ever really fight in a, in a <laughs> strategic position anyways? It's like, all right, shields, boys. No, 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 no. <laughs> He's out there wailing away with a sword. Now. I, the reason I say this is that if we go all the way back anyways to the daughters of the emperor, I think that's very much what they were. They trained and fought as warriors. But after they became the sisters of battle, they became, as you just described in ways, much more militant, much more soldiery. And I think that has really helped them out anyways throughout the, the millennia. Well, that's interesting. Now, next week we will discuss the true sisters of battle. We figured it would be prudent to mention the other Ordo Majoris that don't wage war against the enemies of the Imperium. Correct, brother. But while they may not shed the blood of the Emperor's enemies, they still hold vital roles in the Imperium, none of which is more important than the Order's Hospitaller, who are dedicated to healing and the supply of medical care for all the citizens of the Imperium of Man. All of them? <laughs> like I said, they are very important. I might even say they're more important than the Sisters of Battle. Now, needless to say, they are the most beloved and widely welcomed of the Adeptus Sororitas. The Hospitallers are sent to war zones or disaster-stricken areas of the galaxy, providing the people of the Imperium with medical care and compassion where it is most needed. Now, Yuxin, and I know this is surprising, especially in the Imperium of Warhammer 40k, that whole thing, compassion. <laughs> They do it well. The sisters of these orders aid the poor and heal the sick and the wounded in many hospitals and clinics across the Imperium operated as charities by the sisterhood. Their convents often take the form of hospitals and retreats, and large numbers of them accompany the armies of the Ostra Militarum. They are often found as part of the Imperial Crusades serving in battlefield hospitals on board warships in orbit. However, there are rare circumstances when they will go into battle with Imperial Guard troops to provide support in the field when a platoon's medic is wounded. It is these battle-hardened women that the members of the Inquisition often look for to join their retinues as acolytes. So skilled are the sisters hospitaller that they are regarded as saints by the common soldiery, 
who far prefer their gentle ministrations to the crude work undertaken by the field surgeons of the Departmento Minatorium. The Order's Hospitaller provides surgeons, physicians, and nurses. The Sisters' Hospitaller are amongst the most skilled and compassionate soldiers in the Imperium. Sisters' Hospitaller often serve in conjuncture with members of other orders of the Adeptus Sororitas. Their ability to heal and return wounded battle sisters to the battlefield makes them invaluable allies to the Order's militant. But their knowledge of genetics also makes them useful to Order's famulous investigations. More about them later. Mm -hmm. At the same time, their command of the anatomy of the human body often leads them to accompanying an inquisitor into the torture chamber. This is the darker side of the sisterhood. And as they are the interrogators of the Adepta, it is a true measure of their dedication to the Emperor that these supremely skilled and compassionate individuals are often put aside all selfish thoughts of their personal morality and turn their hands to inflicting pain when duty calls them to do so. These sisters display incredible healing skills and compassion towards the wounded and fallen, yet remain implacable foes to the heretic witches, and mutants around them. Now, traditionally, the sisters of the Ordo Hospitaller dress in light armor and healer's robes that allow for easy movement. Uh, for example, in the Calexis sector, all but one of the Order's Hospitaller have some sort of crimson and bone coloring on their robes to mark them as medical staff. The Order of the Quiet Sorrow on Sigurd IV alone wears a black and bone color scheme in penitence for its past failing. Wow, I didn't realize it provides so much to the Imperium. I mean, I can understand them being um, more appreciated than the uh, surgeon that they're just like, yep, going to sew you up now, but, but I still have a huge, you know, gash and stuff coming out. Two meds. Any meds? Nope. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, by the way, yeah, the surgeon's the surgeons and the medics of the Austro military remind me a lot of, maybe I'm wrong about this, Yuxin, but they remind me a lot of the Terran 42 Civil War surgeons, <laughs> where it's kind of like, he got shot in the leg. Well, we got to cut it off. Laudanum, vodka. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's kind of how I kind of picture them, as opposed to the hospitallers. Who it's now, this, now this we form. do know, having having read some of scribings of Dan Abnett, that they are low like that. But you know, let's face it: if you're in the middle of a war zone, it's not a high priority. Of let's see how comfortable we can make this person. <laughs> well, it's it's not only that, but it's also the concept, anyways, of who would you rather have work on you? <laughs> would you ha rather have? This grungy old man who's like smoking a cigar <laughs> with a with a <laughs> bloody, you know, saw anyway. He's going, yep, we can fix this. Or would you rather have a beautiful woman <laughs> who's like, I have medication that will help you along with this thing called painkillers. <laughs> There's this a woman that's quite a big, big needle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, the, the needle might still, you might be like, oh no. But at the same time, at least, I'd rather have, at least if I'm going to die, I'd rather see a beautiful woman in front of me rather than old man McGee yeah. <laughs> who puts his cigarette or his, or his cigar butt out anyways on your shoulder <laughs> before he gets going. <laughs> but Hey, it diverts the pain so you won't be like... <laughs> it diverts the pain. This is our painkiller. <laughs> You're going to be feeling this instead of that. <laughs> See, but, you didn't feel a shot at all, did you? <laughs> no. To me, anyways, the shocking part about this is that they, they, they are the medics for all of humanity. I actually didn't know about that until I started reading about this. Which, okay. We'll probably get into this later, but quite frankly, anyways, to me, with the Adeptus Sororitas, this is probably the most important group yeah i mean you're talking about i mean they they literally are the medics of the imperium of man that's that's well where they're able to reach anyways well yeah, yeah. 
so many people need help. So few people that can help. Yes, I understand that. But despite the huge amount of orphans out there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just to me anyways, that is just kind of shocking. The, the, they real, that is what they hold. I also, by the way, think it's funny anyways that this is all considered charity. You know they're getting all their stuff from tithes, right? This is yeah. This has to be this has to be sanctioned. So, well, we know that they're they're connected to the ecclesiarchy, and the ecclesiarchy definitely gets money, right? I mean, so, they are. Oh, sorry, they are the adeptus ministorum. So you know, that, which is which is in this particular situation, anyways, with the sisters of battle, they are, I believe, funded by the ecclesiarchy. So I guess you could I guess you could actually still call charity. So it's not actually coming from the tides of world it, worlds. It's coming from what people give to the church. Actually, the ecclesiarchy is kind of double dipping, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They are. <laughs> yes, surprised it, it took us from the government and also <laughs> from the people. I'm I'm surprised it took us this long to figure that out. <laughs> wow, no, they, they really haven't double dipping at all. I'm surprised you said normally, normally we kind of ferret this stuff out, but this is the first good point. <laughs> I never really even thought about that, but yeah, they definitely are. Well, dumb. they're now called the Adeptus Mistorum. It's like, <laughs> ah, that's how they're getting paid by the government. By the so, way, they're also getting charity funds and <laughs> tithes from the masses. Wow. It's kind of shocking, but I mean, okay. So what do you think of these medics? I personally think, anyways, they're probably the most important part of the the Adeptus Sororitas. But what do you think of them? Well, I do think they are very important. I think all of the different groups have a high amount of importance, though, to them. Right. I love how, despite everything, they still have a militant aspect to them, though, because they, they all wear armor, generally. Oh, yes, they're all still very regimented. And yes, they are all very militant, even though they don't really fight anybody. What? Well, they still have mo moderate training. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's kind of like, anyways, in Terran 42, a field medic for the U.S. military. They're still going through boot camp, <laughs> you know? They're still going to understand, anyways, how to fire a rifle, how to, you know, kill the enemy. But that's not their main priority. Yeah. So... I just, yeah, they're just, <laughs> I think they're actually fairly interesting and, and I would love to talk about them more, but you did mention the Order Famulus, right? They're also well, non-militant, I think, well, right? Actually, you were the one who mentioned it, but <laughs> yes, the second non-militant unit we were going to discuss was the Order's Famulus. I believe you said you were going to talk about it later. Yes, but I didn't mention that. You did. <laughs> you serve amongst the households of the highest of the Imperium of Man's nobility, acting as chamberlains, counselors, and consuls. They broker inner house alliances, trade deals, and marriages, and their hand is ever at work amongst the highest echelons of Imperial power. The Sisters Femulus are skilled diplomats able to reconcile the most bitter of rivals. But their true mission is often performed entirely behind the scenes. Where the sisters' famulus have worked over the last several millennia, tithes have been maintained or increased, trade has improved, and in general, the population has fared better than on other worlds. With such clear evidence of the benefits that they bring, the sisters' famulus are in high demand amongst noble families throughout the Imperium. Nova sisters who display strong communication skills and a distinct ability to stay calm under pressure are often drafted into the Order's famulus. Unlike most other orders in the sisterhood, sororitas in this non-militant role are trained in critical thinking, etiquette, and economics of interstellar trade and commerce, in addition to their focus on devotional studies and services. As they learn, they are sent to noble houses and trade consortiums to help guide the nobility. From the nobility's point of view, the sisters' role is to help their house. For the sisterhood, however, their efforts are intended to influence the nobles' decisions, 
so that his work will help the greater Imperium as well as advance his house's selfish interests. Greatly concerned with the spiritual and genetic purity of the human race, through their arranging of alliances and marriages, sisters famous are able to take a direct hand in the fate of humanity. For those they counsel wield the power of whole worlds and control the fates of billions. The servants of the Order's famulus do not openly discuss this element of their work, even with other members of the Sisterhood. But many do appear to have extensive contact with members of the Inquisition, especially the Ordo Hereticus. Within the ranks of that Order, the Sisters' famulus seem to maintain the most extensive contacts with those who subscribe to the doctrines of the Thorian sect of the Inquisition. The Sisters Famulus keep extensive records of the bloodlines and mercantile dealings of virtually every noble family within their assigned sector. Combined with the records of the Order's Hospitaller and the Order's Dialogus, Sisters Famulus have access to an extensive history of the noble families in their area of the galaxy. Uh, par there pardon me, brother. Does that mean also rogue traders? At least the... Uh, um noble households from way back when uh possibly hmm maybe Sounds that's good. how that one uh <laughs> that's a good point yeah person, this person's just like uh oh wow i can't believe i found this document wait I'm really to <laughs> <laughs> sorry 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 i was just kind of interested because as you know anyways the original rogue traders were actually nobility from ancient earth so I, I was just kind of curious. And then the emperor said, you go out there. Why? Because I don't want you near me. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I can see his particular standpoint on this. But sorry, sorry. Uh, carry on, sir. I, I was just kind of curious. Okay. Their knowledge makes them very valuable to the Order of Hereticus Inquisitors, especially the Thorians, as tracing the bloodlines of well-known heretics has often uncovered leads on much larger conspiracies. Much of the work of these sisters also involves tracking the manifestations of saints, and they often become involved in the arcane process of determining whether or not an individual is to be sainted. They are also deeply involved in investigations surrounding the appearance of so-called living saints, perhaps due to their connections with the Thorians and their manipulations of noble bloodlines. They have on several occasions predicted and prepared for the arrival of a living saint long before she was ever born. Like their fellow non-militant orders, the Order's Famulus are divided between the Combat Sectorum on Ophelia, which includes the Order of the Key and the Order of the Gate, and the Convent Prioris on Terra, which includes the Order of the Holy Seal and the Order of the Sacred Coin. To be a Sister Famulus is to be exposed to licentious ways of the imperial nobility. Though the sisters rarely step outside of their official duties, they still find it difficult to avoid noticing the depravity that often serves as entertainment amongst the upper social echelons. They know they have been deemed strong enough to withstand the pressures of this duty and have studied how to help those in need of their services. Unlike other orders, they are likely to ask questions and listen before smiting the unbeliever immediately. They typically wear the armored robes of the non-militant orders, though these are often tailored to reflect local clothing styles as befitting their station and duty. While the Sisters Famous try to stay above the mechanizations of the political arenas, they have been occasionally known to mediate disputes and moderate councils. Legatine Cristal, from the Abbey of the Dawn, is often away from her Icanthos fortress and has been spotted in recent years reestablishing a mission on Malfi and arranging a marriage between Frederick Crin of House Crin and Josie Sestelli of the Sestelli Alliance on Scintilla. It is rumored that the Legatine even officiated at the actual ceremony and blessed the union on behalf of the order. So, brother, what do you think of these brokers slash advisors? Well, I actually have a lot of thoughts about them, but I think anyways that I'm, I'm just going to tie it in anyways with the last group that we have to talk about. 
which is the last non-militant group. And that would be the Orders Dialogus. They are considered the most learned of scholars, especially in the field of both human and xenos linguistics. They are responsible for the translation of innumerable dialects utilized throughout the Imperium, as well as assisting the Inquisition with the study of long-dead alien languages, helping them to translate texts from recovered artifacts. Though they specialize in languages and processing information, Sisters Dialogus are just as martially trained and fanatically devoted to the Imperial Creed as any battle sister. Sisters of Dialogus generally leave their data stacks only when their linguistic or cipher-breaking skills are needed. There have been occasions where full missions are sent to retrieve data, though this is rare because the risk involving sisters with access to sacred and secret information out into the open is very dangerous, and it has to be authorized by the convent. You think? This has led the Dialogus to be a much more cloistered and in some ways naive order than the others. Sisters Dialogus are talented at breaking ciphers and translating texts. They are also extremely diligent in caring for the records they are entrusted with and guarding the secrets of the ecclesiarchy and the sisterhood. They understand knowledge is useless if you don't act on it. Any extended field assignment with either the Inquisition or the Ecclesiarchy grants them a unique opportunity to experience the Imperium firsthand and use their knowledge to actively hunt down heretics and pry their secrets from them. They also know that the information they seek and guard comes from the eternal threat of temptation. It has been drummed into them that they cannot fail in their duties because when condemned knowledge falls into the hands of the unwary, catastrophe often follows. You, you know, brother, the more we have talked about the non-militant groups, the more I think they are far more important than the sisters in the order of battle. Why? Well, okay, so I, I was actually going to say this earlier, but I figured I'd just pull it into one huge unit here. So you talked about the Famulus, and they are literally the ambassadors and the advisors of the Imperium, right? Uh, no. No? They aren't really ambassadors. Okay, explain how they're not ambassadors. Ambassadors, well, when I think of ambassadors, I think about people that you send out to, like, other countries. Okay. They are basically based in their generic area. Well, no, no, no. It's, it sounds like, okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, anyways, they are often used as what I would call ambassadors to other noble families. They are the diplomats. They are the ones that make sure anyways, everything is smooth. That's what an ambassador does. Now, mind you, okay, I understand what you're talking about. You're talking about like for another country. So yes, they obviously don't go to the orcs and go, hey, let's sort this out. <laughs> but I do think anyways, they do go to other noble families anyways and try to figure out anyways how they can keep like, for instance, civil wars from taking place. I, I would put them more down as mediators than ambassadors. What do you think an ambassador is? It's a mediator. <laughs> Anyways, okay. moving we're, on. We're, we're arguing about semantics here. <laughs> but but you do, I, I think you will agree with me on this anyways, is that the, their concept is, is that they are there to make sure that the Imperium doesn't just self-destruct in civil war. They're there to make sure that people are getting along. High nobility. I, and they're I, supposed to be there to advise them as well. Ironically, they seem to be the business people. Ironically, if you think about it, because they're taught in, one of the things I find funny is how they emphasize that they're taught in critical thinking. Unlike the militant orders, the Deptus Rortis, like, right. they aren't taught and educated in critical thinking. Well, that explains a few things. Uh, well, okay, there's a difference anyways. But I'm anyways. What they're supposed to be doing. I mean, the Sisters of Battle, the nuns with guns, as we all know anyways, their whole concept is war, right? So, tactics. That's what they learn. These guys, on the other hand, anyway, or sorry, these girls, on the other hand, their concept Maybe. is to make sure everything in the Imperium is running smoothly. They're there to advise the nobles. 
They're there to make deals with merchants. They are there anyways to make sure that the Imperium keeps running smoothly, right? And to um, more specifically based around the nobility. And right, right. also, um, in some cases, try to find out who the next... Oh, uh, by the way, just in case you're wondering, I know some people may be wondering what the Thorians are. The Thorians are a purest faction of the Ordos that believes it, that the Emperor is resurrected in at least parts of his power resurrected in different beings. Yeah, he's the floating deity that yes. can send his power into different people. But only a fraction of it, because, you know. Right. Because if he did all of it anyways, they would just like, pop like a pimple. <laughs> what? Now, get that, get that concept out of your head. <laughs> what? you said. And, and then we got this last group, the Dialogus, who, <laughs> they are the translators. They're the people anyways, and, and, and we haven't talked about this much, but because the Imperium is so vast and so large, there are so many different dialects. Okay, a good example on a small portion, take Terran 42. Okay, Hugson? So if we went to, let's say, Washington State, all right? And we went to talk to somebody there anyways, and we could have a conversation, right? Right. But then if we go to the deep south, say New Orleans, you might be able to understand what they're saying, but at the same time, not really the concept of what they're saying because it's a different dialect of, right. of, of the same language. Now, we could also pop all the way over to England where, you know, English first started. And you talk to these people anyways, and you've got, yet again, another dialect. So my... <laughs> What's that? Scrape by with. My scrape by with. And then we go to France. I got nothing. Well, France is a different language. But you could even, just on that island anyways, you could go north anyways to Scotland. And you've got a completely different dialect there. Or you could jump across the pond or, or jump across the way. And you get to Ireland. And they've got a completely different way of saying the same thing. They're all speaking English. But... They all speak it a different way. It's very much like what these sisters are, are, are doing here anyways. They understand the dialects. They're all speaking Gothic, but they understand the oh. dialects. So the concept to me, though, is, is that, like I said before, anyways, to me, these guys are far more important than actually the sisters of battle. Now, like I said before, you asked why. Well, I'll give you why. So when you think of the Imperium of Man... What are the greatest soldiers of the Imperium of Man? Well, some say it would be the Custodes. Uh, definitely. But the ones, anyways, that are out fighting wars. Well, that would be mainly the Space Marines. Right. The Star Days. So the Space yeah. Marines, anyways, they are the biggest, baddest thing. And then next to that, anyways, you have the large mass of the Austro Militarum. The Sisters of Battle... Well, they are very impressive, and they do have a very good fighting record. To me, anyways, it's far more important that these other non-militants are actually there because you have military units that you can already throw at the enemy. Right. You don't have these other three sects. Well, as sense? we established, it's mainly one of the main uses for the Sisters of Battle is the Ordo Hereticus, which we both agree shouldn't really exist because the ecclesiarchy shouldn't exist. Well, and, and at the very least, anyways, because it does exist, you should have far less power. Yes. But, no, no, what, what I'm saying is, is that you have all these different warriors of humanity, anyways, willing to go out and fight. And, don't get me wrong, the Sisters of Battle, I think, also, anyways, uh, they contribute as well. But these three non-combatant ones do far more, in my opinion, for the Imperium than the Sisters of Battle do. And like I said before, why? Well, it's because we have all these other warriors. Nobody else does this. That's the thing that I find interesting about this. 
And, and that's why I think, anyways, they're far more important than the Sisters of Battle. But that's just my two cents. What, what do you think, Yuxin? No, I actually agree with you. What? I think they are more prevalent than the Sisters of Battle. It's <laughs> just... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold, hold on, have a second. You're agreeing with me? Wow. It's not going to happen. Well, yeah, every few millennia or so, it does happen. Okay, well, then fine. <laughs> wow. Um, the sad thing is about it, though, is because they all have this aspect of being almost behind the scenes. The one that's maybe the most prolific when it comes to being seen is the hospital art. Mm -hmm. That's because they're like field medic sort of like people. Right. As we established, the famous is mainly operates behind the scenes. They're generally like advisor role positions. I mean, they they even their clothes is even tailored to look like they should fit in. Right. And then the um, dialogue just are just kind of the space nerds. We <laughs> keep you in the basement until we need you. <laughs> the space nerds. <laughs> Which is unfortunate because they're actually, I mean, just the concept anyways, well, they, they can speak all these different languages. And and like I said before, anyways, they can speak all the different dialects of Gothic. But at the same time, they also speak Xenos languages. So right. that concept and all the anyways, other dialects that even the Imperium use. Like I'm pretty sure some of them know um, the Chagoras language. Yeah. I mean, just, just all these different languages they know and, and just... Yeah. As you know, Yuxin, there is nothing more frustrating than trying to communicate with somebody that doesn't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> just simply because they just don't understand the language. <laughs> or even sometimes the person that even does understand the language can't understand what you're saying because you can't talk clearly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, hey. That has something to do with the way that I say things, doesn't it? I'm not saying that. The fact That's that you not... thought I was, though. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Begs the question. Well, on that terrible thought, that'd be it for this week. Uh, join us next week. As like my brother said before, we will talk about the major orders of the Sisters of Battle. You know, the warrior women that everybody knows and loves. Fantastic. Oh, and don't forget, at the end of the month, we do our Q&A, where we answer your question. You send us in the comments. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this box. Uh, feel free to like, follow, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to check out the shop. We got some cool stuff there, including some new merchandise. But they're all on pillows, clothes, and hats. Oh, and don't forget the rabbits. You can't forget those. <sighs> yep. And don't forget the rabbits. Honestly, Yuxin would love you to buy a rabbit. And send us pictures. We'd love to have those. But have a great day. And as always, <clears throat> until next time, this is Akthar. And Yuxin. Signing off.